Honorable Chairman, members of the committee, <clears throat> in my prepared remarks submitted to you, I review the dev development of the tools of disrupting democracies as they have been used. First, in my part of the world, Eastern Europe, and later in Western Europe, and ultimately elsewhere. <clears throat> to sum up my written testimony, we are under attack. It is an attack against Western democracies and on the institutions that bind them, the EU and NATO. This attack is at once asymmetrical, yet ideologically promiscuous. By the latter, I mean that an authoritarian regime supports both extreme left and extreme right parties that are both, or on both sides, anti-EU, anti-NATO, and anti-US, and it does what it can to undermine centrist parties and centrist politicians. It is asymmetrical because our democratic institutions, free and fair elections, rule of law, respect for fundamental rights and freedoms, especially freedom of the press, do not allow us to respond in kind. These tactics, disruption of the internet, hacking into parliaments, political parties and candidates, and more importantly, doxing or publishing hacked private correspondence and ultimately spreading false stories or fake news, represent a new form of aggression. And I say it is aggression. Uh, von Clausewitz said almost 200 years ago, war is the continuation of policy by other means. So why engage in military conflict if you can change democratic governments in order to follow policies uh, <clears throat> you favor, um, such as, for example, lifting of sanctions for its occupation and annexation of Crimea? If the unity of the European Union to main sanctions or to stand up to corrupt <clears throat> corruption stymies your foreign policy, if NATO is willing, is, <clears throat> is, um, uh, willing to stand up for the security of its easternmost allies, why not foment anti-EU and anti-NATO and an anti-American sentiment by supporting fringe parties that share that view? We should be concerned. This year, we shall see elections of three of the four remaining large EU countries, France and Germany, and as most observers predict, a snap election in Italy. The Netherlands, a crucial partner in NATO and the EU, holds elections today as we speak. I should add that the Dutch are so fear disruption that they have gone back to paper ballots, eschewing even voting machines. Disinformation, hacking, fake stories have all been used in these countries to support far-right and far-left anti-NATO, anti-U and anti-US parties and candidates and against centrist transatlanticists, most notably Mrs. Merkel. Only in the past several weeks we have seen the Foreign Minister of Canada, Christia Freeland, also come under fake, a fake attack. The age of the internet has allowed these practices to flourish, especially disinformation. Statistics in Europe are not yet out, but BuzzFeed here in the US reported that in the last three months leading up to the US election, fake news stories were shared on Facebook 8.7 million times, surpassing mainstream shared mainstream news by 1.4 million shares. Meanwhile, the Pew Center reported last summer that 62% of Americans get their news from social media. There's no reason to think that the statistics in other advanced democratic countries that are facing elections should differ from what we have seen in the US. And secondly, and in conclusion, this, the de other dilemma we face is that these threats from authoritarian regimes are asymmetric. That is to say, we can't do to them what they do to us. Authoritarian regimes control the press. They're not afraid of hacks or doxing that would show the corruption of their rulers. People never see that news. Fake news, as deplorable as they may be, have no traction there uh, when the press is controlled. And ultimately, it doesn't really matter anyway if you count the votes in the end. Oh, fake news, interference, and electoral processes we've observed already a long time ago in Eastern Europe are new to our NATO allies in the West. We used to have to jump hoops to prove fake stories about us were in fact fake. But now, I don't want to say use the German word schadenfreude, but now in some senses we feel redeemed seeing that now 
more Western countries are facing what we have faced for a quarter of centuries. And I'll conclude, if you give me 20 seconds, with a quote from Jonathan Ayall, the director of the uh, Ministry of Defense uh, think tank, Ruzi, in London. Quote, we spent 20 years telling the Eastern Europeans that they were paranoid, living in the past, that they should treat Russia as a normal country. Now it turns out they were right. To prevent this from becoming an existential rift, to keep former communist countries still believing in the alliance, NATO is going to need to do a lot of clever footwork. Unquote. Thank you very much. Well, I'm impressed with how well I understand Estonian. That was, that was excellent. Uh, Ms. Conley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, and members of the subcommittee. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to testify. It is absolutely vital that we understand Russia's strategy of influence, how it works in our democracies, and to develop an effective strategy to combat it. It's so important that we recognize not only the tools that Russia uses, but we have to educate Americans on how to recognize these tools and to defeat their influence. Russia's strategy of influence is contained in Russia's doctrine, New Generation Warfare, of which its primary goal is to break the internal coherence of the enemy system. Russian influence works through a variety of economic and political channels, and it adapts to specific national situations, including biased news outlets, intelligence networks, Russian-financed non-governmental organizations, business linkages, and friendly politicians. While all of these tactical elements need to be understood in their own right, we can't lose sight of their cumulative effect and their overarching strategic objective, and that is the weakening of U.S. global leadership and its dominance of the international system. It's the weakening and ultimate collapse of NATO and the European Union. And finally, it is about the breakdown of the internal coherence, credibility, and moral authority of Western democracies. And once this coherence and cohesion is broken, uh, a post-Western Western world can in fact be achieved. So let's be clear that it, Russia does not engineer the entire framework in which it conducts its strategy. It takes advantage of pre-existing institutional, political, and governance weaknesses and exploits them. So in fact, uh, we must look to ourselves and our rules and our laws to help uh, defeat Russian influence. So CSIS, in cooperation with our Bulgarian partner, the Center for the Study of Democracy, focused on uh, how Russian economic influence impacts five European countries. I ask that a copy of the report be submitted for the record. We describe Russian tactics as an unvirtuous circle of influence. It takes hold of democratic societies through two channels, political and economic influence. The political influence can come through anti-European and fringe parties. It can go through individuals, possibly businessmen who've turned uh, uh, politicians, non-governmental organizations. It can spread through information wars and even the Russian Orthodox Church. The economic channel is more powerful in some respects. It works through a network of Kremlin uh, insiders, former intelligence officers, and local oligarchs to manipulate and dominate strategic sector, sectors of a country's economy. And our report looked at how both of these channels, both the political and the economic work together, and what we found is that corruption is the key and principal conduit for the impact of Russian influence. And the reason that they go after those strategic sectors like energy, like finance, is that's where there are the biggest opportunities to exploit uh, and use corruption. But what has allowed Russia's strategy to be so successful is Western susceptibility and in some ways complicit uh, complicitness with Russia's exploitation. And we found this over and over where we're not influencing and impacting our own transparency laws, our beneficial ownership, um, abuse of funding for political party financing and non-governmental organizations. It's in fact in our power to, uh, it, to stop these Russian tactics. So in our report, uh, we recommend that our first line of defense is strengthening Western democratic institutions and societies. We believe that the Treasury Department will play a critical role in how we combat uh, Russian economic influence by tracking and tracing illicit Russian-linked uh, financial flows. We uh, encourage strongly a very robust cooperation with the European Union in fighting uh, these 
corrupt practices, strengthening the independent judiciary and independent media and governance practices of our NATO allies, building uh, and strengthening financial transparency requirements and beneficial ownership will go an extraordinary way to prevent these corrupt practices to further Russian influence. Finally, I'd like to say in our U.S. embassies, we need to start thinking of our legal attaches as perhaps playing as critical a role in defending the United States as our defense attaches. Our national security and the security of America's most important allies rests on our ability to resist Russia's strategy of influence, and thus far, we have failed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Ranking Member, and members of the subcommittee. Uh, the primary focus of my academic research at Harvard and at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars is examining how nations use their capabilities for attack and espionage in cyberspace and the strategies that drive that usage. It goes without saying that Russia is a key player in this regard, so I'd like to make three points here to begin the discussion. First, we often think of Russian hacking as something that is new and different, but to do so is to be ignorant of history. There is a demonstrated pattern of Russian cyber operations stretching back several decades at this point. One major early case, sometimes referred to as Moonlight Maze, involved a series of penetrations for espionage purposes into American political, military, and economic institutions. That operation and the operations since then have shown adeptness in several ways. Perhaps most significant is that they demonstrate how the Russians have developed new digital methods to accomplish old tasks. The series of espionage cases show the Russian aptitude for gathering information using computer hacking. The 2007 attack on Estonia and the 2008 attack on Georgia are an exhibit of how Russia uses cyber operations against democratic states. Though we know somewhat less about it, the 2015 blackout in Ukraine, the first ever publicly known case of a power outage caused by a cyber attack, shows the potency of cyber attacks that appear to be Russian in origin. And the 2016 election interference demonstrates that the Russians have married their long-standing history of influence operations with their more recently developed capacity for hacking. The threat these activities pose to democracies and to their fundamental institutions deserves great scrutiny and often resistance. Second, there is a damaging perception that it is impossible to understand who is responsible for which activities in cyberspace. This is sometimes a contribution problem, and it is not nearly the roadblock that it is sometimes made out to be. Alongside Professor Thomas Ridd of King's College London, I spent a year investigating how it is possible to do attribution in cyberspace. After technical study and interviews with computer forensic experts in the private sector and in multiple intelligence agencies, we concluded that not only is accurate attribution possible, but that advanced nations such as the United States do it regularly. It is possible to do some form of attribution by relying on forensics data, uh, such as language indicators, infrastructure indicators, time zone exploit indicators, among many others. For intelligence agencies, human and singles intelligence sources can provide additional vital information on the intentions of another state and can confirm attribution hypotheses. Rarely is any single piece of evidence by itself conclusive when it comes to doing attribution in cyberspace. Hackers do sometimes leave false flags to try to mislead investigators. Nonetheless, the United States intelligence community and private sector firms have overcome the attribution problem in many instances in recent years and have developed a strong understanding of how various nations, including Russia, operate in cyberspace. As early as the middle of last summer, the technical evidence strongly indicated that the Russians were responsible for the hacking activities against the Democratic National Committee and the related entities. The United States intelligence community report gives me still greater confidence in this assessment. In short, when it comes to many major Russian cyber activities, attribution is simply not an issue. Third, I'd like to close by taking a broader view. Every cyber activity takes place in a strategic context, and we would do well to remember that context when we analyze them and consider responses. Old strategic ideas, such as deterrence, do not go away when it comes to this new mode of engagement between nations, though they are often, at first, difficult to translate. Many of the Russian activities occur, I believe, because Russia has developed the capability to act, senses an opportunity to do so, and calculates that the benefits of the operation will exceed the costs. In short, we have not yet been able to devise means of deterrence in cyberspace that extend to the kinds of activities we are discussing here today.
Establishing deterrence with our own cyber capabilities has proven challenging, in part because we have not always communicated our resolve well, and in part because we are rightly worried about further escalation. These difficulties are important and deserve strategic attention. We must find ways to better defend our vital computer systems, denying adversaries the opportunity to act. We must develop methods of deterrence that impose costs for significant malicious actions, and we must communicate those clearly. I am mindful of the lesson from history, sometimes called the security dilemma, that nations often unintentionally threaten one another as they preserve their interests. I have written a great deal about how the security dilemma can apply to cyberspace. And so I believe we must develop a strategy that protects our interests but does not unduly threaten other nations. Calibrating a response in this fashion is not an easy task, but it is a vital one. After what has happened this past year, few issues are more important than this right now. Thank you very much. Chairman Graham, <clears throat> Ranking Member Whitehouse, it's a real pleasure to see you again. Um, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the invitation to appear before you today. You're doing a real service by having this hearing today and highlighting what has really sort of gotten lost in much of the political controversy since last fall's election, which is that today we are facing an unprecedented and growing threat to democratic institutions around the globe. As my fellow panelists have eloquently testified, this threat is real and has already manifested itself in a number of different countries around the world, including in the nations of Central and Eastern Europe, in Estonia, in the nation of Georgia, and here in the United States, where the intelligence community assesses that elements of the Russian government directed an influence campaign against our political system in 2016 that involved the cyber intrusions into state and local election board systems, the penetration of the DNC and the release of material that influenced the campaign, the use of internet trolls to spread disinformation, and the launching of a general propaganda campaign to spread their preferred narrative around the world. Given the perceived success of these tactics in roiling our election, we should all expect to see more of them in future elections, not only from Russia, but also from other hostile countries like Iran and North Korea. So the threat is real and it's growing. The next question is how can we respond or how should we respond to the threat? And the government has a number of tools at its disposal. First, it has all the national security investigative tools like FISA court electronic surveillance orders and national security letters, as well as the criminal tools that it can use to detect these influence activities. Second, it has the ability to bring a criminal prosecution against the perpetrators under, for instance, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act for hacking into protected computer systems, or under the Foreign Agent Registration Act for those who engage in domestic political activities on behalf of a foreign party without registering as foreign agents. Criminal prosecution can have a meaningful deterrent effect, as we saw in 2015 when the Chinese finally agreed to an international protocol against cyber theft, but only after we had charged five members of the Chinese military with stealing American trade secrets. Deterrence can also be effectively achieved through the application of economic and trade sanctions, such as when President Obama imposed sanctions last December on Russia's two leading intelligence services and four Russian intelligence officials. And deterrence can be achieved through the ejection of a country's official staff from the United States, such as when the president ejected 35 suspected Russian intelligence operatives and closed two official Russian facilities at the same time that he imposed sanctions last December. Another option is the enforcement of uh, campaign finance laws to prevent foreign nationals and foreign interests from contributing to U.S. political campaigns. With the recent reports of Russian funding for a French far-right pr party presidential candidate, allegedly in part as a reward for her supporting Russia's actions in Crimea, there is heightened concern that Russia may make similar attempts to sway American politics with campaign funding and contributions. And a final area of focus is on the protection of the electoral systems themselves, which was the purpose behind DHS's announcement in January this year that election processes will henceforth be designated as critical infrastructure, like the energy grid or the telecommunications industry, and other crit critical sectors that receive federal assistance and protection. So those are a number of the tools and capabilities being used to meet the threat. In light of recent events, however, we need to think of ways to strengthen those tools, and I'd like to flag three such ways. The first is to give the Justice Department statutory authority to get a legal enforcement injunction against operators of botnets that take over networks and computers and launch disruptive attacks, as we saw Russia do in Estonia in 2007. As the authors of that bill, the chairman and I heartily agree. I thought you would, sir. Um, the second is to enhance the effectiveness of the Foreign Agent Registration Act by giving Justice Department attorneys the authority to compel suspected foreign agents to turn over records that show whether they are or are not, in fact, working on behalf of foreign interests. 
And the third is simply a recommendation that the government seriously consider the deterrence that is available under the international law concept of countermeasures, which are unlawful actions that a victim nation can lawfully take in order to persuade another country to stop victimizing it, like uh, an example of being a victim nation hacking back to persuade another country to stop hacking them. While this approach raises a host of difficult questions, I agree with the many commentators who encourage the government to consider such countermeasures as a means of deterring future foreign interference in our elections. So to conclude, we do have a number of effective tools and capabilities to meet this threat. The real question for today, however, is whether we also have the single-minded focus and the will to do so. All too often, we as a country have been slow to mobilize in the face of a looming threat, such as we were with Al-Qaeda in the 1990s and with the cyber threat in the 2000s. It's my hope that we will not be slow in responding to this threat. This hearing is an important step in the right direction, but it's critical that we follow up with a resolute and decisive action. The threat is real, and it is not an overstatement to say that there is a lot at stake, no less than the continuing viability of democratic processes around the world. I want to thank the subcommittee again for holding this hearing and for giving me the opportunities to speak about this important topic, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have.